Hello there, everybody, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly uh, podcast uh, slash uh, internet radio uh, look at all things uh, Beatles, both uh, their history and what's uh, what's happening today. Uh, I'm Al Sussman from uh, Beatle Fan Magazine, and uh, we have a, uh, another special guest uh, today. And uh, before I introduce this special guest... I'll introduce my uh, my three co-hosts. Uh, first of all, the uh, the host of the syndicated Beatles uh, radio show, um, Every Little Thing, Ken Michaels. Hi, Al. Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening. And the uh, uh, the proprietor of uh, the uh, Beatles Examiner column and uh, and various other Examiner columns at Examiner dot com. That's uh, Steve Marinucci. Hi, Al. Hello, everyone. And last but certainly not least, uh, a member, another member of the Beatle fan family, for uh, for many many years, and uh, also a noted classical music uh, reviewer and uh, musicologist, Alan Cozen. Hey, Al, and hello, everyone. And we have a, a very special guest. Someone who um, uh, Alan and I particularly know very well because she's been part of the Beatle fan family for uh, just about twenty years, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. She was a uh, uh, she broke down se- several barriers at Beatle fan uh, back in the eighties or nineties, actually uh, as pretty much the first woman to uh, to have a you know, a steady gig at Beatle Fan. Uh, she also uh, began doing a column about uh, that uh, that new frontier back then called the Internet. And uh, she has continued to write for Beatle Fan and for various other websites and, and uh, various other elements and... Uh, a lot of that has gone into, she has actually two books coming out uh, this year. Uh, and, uh, her book, Michael Jackson FAQ, will be out uh, in, uh, I think, before the end of the year. And just recently published is the book I have in my hands called Songs We Were Singing, uh, subtitled Guided Tours Through the Beatles' Lesser Known Tracks which is interesting. <laughs> and, and our guest is, uh, as I said, is uh, Beatle fans, longtime internet editor, Kid O'Toole. Hi, everybody. It's, I'm just uh, honored to be here, and, and thank you so much for inviting me. Well, it was, it's our pleasure. Mm-hmm. Our pleasure. Let me ask you first about this subtitle, mm-hmm. um, Guided Tours Through through the Beatles' lesser-known tracks. Now, we're talking about, as I call it, the Rolls-Royce of, uh, of pop music catalogs. How are their lesser-known Beatles tracks? Well, I, I should preface this by saying that um, a number, of, well, a lot of the book is a compilation of a series of, of articles I've done uh, <laughs> as part of a, a, a column called Deep Beatles right. uh, for Something Else Reviews. And uh, I started doing this column for them in uh, 2012. And they wanted me, you know, to uh, write uh, write a column on, uh, and you know, pretty much any facet of the Beatles I I wanted. And mm-hmm. I, you didn't have to ask me twice. I said, of course, love to do sure. it. Sure. And I decided because the readership of something else reviews is so varied. You know, it really is. You get a bit of everything. Um, and including you get the hardcore fans and then you get the more, you know, casual fans. And so I thought it'd be interesting to do the lesser known tracks, meaning the B sides, the album tracks. Um, of course, you know, I get into the DECA sessions, the, uh, the star club, I get into some of that as well, but 
it's material that you generally, or at least, you know, maybe, I, I think these are songs that, that we hardcore fans sometimes take for granted, you know, mm-hmm. and, and songs that casual fans don't even know about, you know, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. Or I've had other people write comments on my, my pieces saying, God, I totally forgot about that song, or I haven't heard that song. And, you know, I, it's just not one I play a lot. And, you know, I, I, I see now, you know, why it's something that should be important. So, uh, so that's the thing, you know, um, I haven't gotten into bootlegs yet, which, you know, I, I plan to in the future, but, uh, but the lesser known are, as I said, these are these songs that, you know, you never hear played on the radio. Um, and you, or they've even been sort of overlooked in, in other books, you know, just write a couple of sentences and then they move on to the quotes, more important songs. Uh, and so this is my deep Beatles and this book is my attempt to say, you know, let's bring these songs back to, you know, let, let's look at them more closely and not just dismiss them as quotes filler tracks you know mm-hmm. but of course mm-hmm. Beatles filler tracks are are better than you know most people's you know great uh, I mean it, uh, you know so-called great songs so so it's hard to say filler but in some ways some of these songs were recorded as just fillers to uh, at the time and of course looking at back at them now they were anything but so uh so yeah that's what I meant by by lesser known Mm-hmm. Now, just, you know, in kind of leafing through the book, um, I come across, I want to tell you, mm-hmm. tell me what is unique, in your opinion, about that particular track? Well, one thing that, that I just think is, is marvelous about is that that chord, that piano chord, that galloping, mm-hmm. discordant chord. Who was doing that in, in a pop song? you know, uh, uh, at that time. I mean, you know, that was such an unusual touch. And I think that is something that that's so indicative of what the Beatles were doing. And of course, as they went on, they got even more experimental. But that is a great example of, of an earl, you know, an earlier case of them, you know, putting something in there that just grabbed the ear and and just was was such a such a kind of an odd, you know, eccentric kind of thing to put in a pop song and yet of course it works and that's what makes it one of the things that makes it such a distinctive song and so that is a that is a classic example of a deep track for me that that it's something that can get over be too easily overlooked and you know we've probably heard it so many times uh and you know us hardcore fans that we kind of forget how revolutionary something like that was in um in pop and rock uh, at that time. So that's, that is a perfect example of what I'm talking about when I talk about lesser known tracks that, that need to be, you know, brought to the forefront. Now I should, uh, should emphasize that the book is not completely about Beatles songs and, and Ken will be happy to know that there's, <laughs> that there's a fair amount of material in there about this, about the solo years. And yeah, I yep. I started writing about that as well when I was with another site. I, I was music editor of a previous site. Uh, well, I'm still still there. Blog critics, and I mm-hmm. uh, wrote about some um, some material there, which I, I'm sure we'll get into. But yep, I talk a bit about uh, certain albums and songs from the solo years that that again I I think have been underrated and deserve more attention. Mm-hmm. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, like for instance. Uh, you particularly you do a particular chapter on press to play. Yep. Which yep. is is not one of those McCartney albums that you know gets a whole lot of praise. No, I mean I I think it was and and I will say and I can say this I'm I'm an '80s kid you know and and I grew up on on '80s music and yes um it 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 is an album from that time uh, a bit overproduced lots of synthesizers I agree with that however there are some fantastic tracks in there and I also give Paul credit for being experimental on that album. Um, I mean, Pretty Little Head is, is one of the weirdest things he ever did, 
<laughs> uh, and, yeah. uh, I mean, it, it's absolutely bizarre. But, you know, I just always thought he deserved more credit for, for trying things like that. You know, for, for trying, I mean, that was quite, a, that album was quite a departure from what he was doing. Uh, well, I mean, before that, it was Broad Street. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and I, he obviously decided to go in a very different direction mm-hmm. uh, with Press to Play. But I think, you know, and, and he got really slammed for that at the time, critically slammed. I remember reading all the articles just absolutely just just slamming that album and looking back i don't think it really deserved that much to be attacked that that harshly and on that note i'm gonna swing over to ken because i'm sure he's got lots of questions well i'm sending you a virtual hug right now Kit, <laughs> for your comments there but because to me press to play is is one of the most underrated of all of paul's albums and i think that paul should be applauded for trying to experiment, like you said, and uh, work with some of the contemporary producers of that time. And I know that, you know, most Beatle fans are very divided on that album. They either love it or they hate it. Yeah. I don't know too many people are in the middle, but it just seems like there are so many people that would like Paul to have that pure McCartney sound that he had in the 70s or in the Beatle years. And when, when he tries to sound contemporary or try to fit whatever the sound is of the moment, um, he gets criticized for that. So there are a lot of fans that don't want to adapt to the change that's going on in music, and Paul tries to dabble every now and then with whatever new producers are doing well in the moment. Just take a look at the new album. Right. And, uh, you know, the producers that he's worked with there. So, you know, he's listening to some of today's new music, and he's trying to adapt to it. And I think a lot of fans who are kind of stuck in the, you know, the classic McCartney mode of the Beatles and Wings don't want a departure from that. So whenever he does try to experiment to some people too much, then he gets slammed for it. So, and I know a lot of Beatle fans who, who love the 60s sound and the 70s sound. And then once the 80s came in and you had those, the synthesizers and the, and the, the heavy drum sound, mm-hmm. um, you know, a lot of fans really resisted that. So um, just like some fans resisted disco, you know, so as as music was changing, you know, and Paul tried to to go along with it somewhat. He never got completely absorbed in it. No. You know, he dabbled a bit like press to play doesn't have too much to me production in that direction. Yes. Uh, pretty little head. Talk more talk. Uh, the song press. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Uh, but there's a lot of, you know, classic McCartney sounds on there, from Footprints to Only Love Remains, you know, Move Over Busker. However, Absurd is very Beatlesque. So, you know. Absolutely. And, anyway. and, well, I was just going to say, when you said Only Love Remains, uh, and Al and I have talked about this in the past, that mm-hmm. is, I think, one of the great lost McCartney ballads. I mean, I thought that was a beautiful song. I mean, just, you know, melodically, lyrically, and... I think it was an adult contemporary hit at the time, but it was, yep. Yeah, but that was it, you know? And, and I always thought that was, it was just such a, ch- I'd love to hear him perform it now. You know, I mean, I, I just think it's, it's one of his lost, it should have been hits. Hmm. I totally agree with you, mm-hmm. but I do want to go back to the Beatle years mm-hmm. uh, a bit because um, one of the things I love about the book is how you go, uh, pretty far back, going back to the deck audition recordings and then into the BBC stuff and the mm-hmm. Star Club recordings. Mm-hmm. Let's just talk a little bit about the deck of stuff because sure. I love listening to those 15 songs because, as as I've said several times, it, it shows the Beatles they're almost getting there. Yep. You know, they're, they're really near getting closer to the sound when they were really a great live band and more polished. How do you pick? Of those of those fifteen songs, I love September in the Rain, for example. I thought that was a great version of it, as well as um, Take Good Care of My Baby. You point out the three Lennon McCartney originals in there mm-hmm. as being songs that that you think uh, deserve you know more respect or examination. Are you saying that because you can see progression in John and Paul as songwriters at the moment, and you're noticing that, and that part of their their, their history is fascinating. Are you saying it because you truly believe these are strong songs? Well, you know, I, I think that 
it's it's a bit more of the first. Um, you know, I love and and this is what I I do throughout this book that I love looking uh, you know really tracing the Beatles' development. You know, their artistic de- development and how I mean rapidly they developed. And as you said, this was the stage where they were you know they were just about there. You know, not not quite mm. coming together. And early, these early compositions, you know, like Like Dreamers Do, you know, that had, Like Dreamers Do has some catchiness to it, you know, and I don't know if, I I don't know if I'd go as far to say, oh, that would have been a hit on the level of Please Please Me, you know, I mean, it's not quite Mm. that arresting to me, but... But the, as I said, their their ability to write, uh, you know, I hate to use the, the cliche, but that's what it is, you know, a hook uh, is is starting to develop. And I think the DECA auditions are very important to look at from that, you know, that level, both for the originals and for the covers. Because too many people like to, you know, I've talked to about it, even have said to me, you know, why are you wasting your time? talking about these those were terrible and everything went wrong and and you know well it's part of their history i mean you can't overlook that and Mm. uh and you know and for example i think george was really sort of the unsung hero uh not to use a pun of uh of the deca uh sessions because I mean, some of the my favorite uh, tracks that they did had him on lead. I mean, you know, Three right. Cool Cats, I think that's a terrific vocal. Mm-hmm. Um, and even though it's corny, Sheik of Araby, I mean, he, I, I thought his vocals were, you know, were great on that. He got that, you know, he has that sort of wink to uh, to his voice. And, uh, and so I think, you know, he was really... Uh, as I said, the unsung hero of those sessions just for his voice. So, I mean, they're, they're really in that process, as you said, of, of development. And that's why it's worth it to revisit those sessions. And also, you know, to see why Ringo was such a, a you know, essential ingredient to the group as well. Because mm-hmm. you can hear something lacking with Pete Best on drums exactly mm-hmm. you know and i've said this before and i'll say it again you know i i mean i'm sure everybody here has met pete best N- you know nice guy i don't like to you know dump on him or anything like that but he just didn't have the versatility and imagination that ringo has you know and and you know every song that you hear on that he he kind of approaches it in the same way you know uh, uh, pete does and hmm. so you just see how Ringo was the last, you know, piece of the puzzle that uh, that brought that, that finally made them become the Beatles that that we you know, that we know. But as I said, those deck auditions are very important to look at and to see, hey, they did have, you know, Lennon and McCartney were developing their craft and there was promise there. Um, right. And uh, but, you know, but they, it's amazing. Look at though how I mean, compare that with, as I said you know, their first album. Incredible how much they grew as songwriters. Amazing. Yeah, and to to think the deck audition recordings and the Please Please Me album were about a year apart. <laughs> exactly. Really, 13 yeah. months. Astounding. Look how much they grew in, in that amount of time. Absolutely. It's, and, it's incredible. And then another 10 months to with the Beatles and the growth that they showed on that album. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, there was constant growth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, I mean, that's one thing that I found uh, another thing writing this book. And I mean, it's something, you know, again, I think we all sort of know it. But but when you really look close, you know, listen closely to these songs, you you just see this this development, this this, you know, artistic development um, from one one album to the next. And you realize, you know, those albums were like a year or less apart. That's I mean, <laughs> that's it's astounding. Yeah, right. It really is. Very true. Very true. Really, really. Who does who does that? Steve, I'm sure you've got some input. Well, you were talking about uh, uh, bootlegs are are something that I'm really into, and you were saying that you were going to get more into bootlegs. If you had to, and I noticed you did actually touch on a couple of bootleg tracks in the book. Mm-hmm. But if you if you had to pick one or two tracks out of all the many bootleg tracks, which ones would you would you consider? Um, as your favorites and ones that would be worth writing about too. Oh my goodness! Well, I would say I I love 
I love listening to how songs develop, you know, mm-hmm. um, how they, they grow. I mean, I love listening to like the early version of Tomorrow Never Knows. You know, I love yeah. hearing that and how, I mean, it was just, and, and the early version, I mean, it was, it, it really, it just show how they, they knew, or John knew early on the sort of sound he wanted. And uh, obviously the end result was, was a bit different, but that sort of the, you know, hallucinogenic kind of quality was there from the beginning. And I love hearing that. Um, I love hearing the development of, uh, Strawberry Fields. I mean, that is, you know, fascinating to hear how, I mean, it, it was such a multi-layered recording in, in many ways. Um, I love that. I love, uh, too, listening to alternate takes. Like, I've always, and I'm sure there'll be listeners now who will say, how dare she, but I love listening to the version of I Am the Walrus without the chanting at the end and, and, huh. and the, I, I love it just straight, you know, and, and I just thought, why didn't they release it like that? You know, I, I mean, the chanting's great, you know, I mean, I understand why they did it, but I love it the other way too, before they added that in, you know? So it's, it's tracks like that, that, that I'd love to talk about. Um, and, uh, and as I said, I plan to start going into that a bit more, but I wanted to sort of ease into that, you know, with, uh, with readers. Um, but those are a few that, that I would, uh, you know, love to go into eventually. Cause as I said, I love listening to how a song develops over time and, and the, you know, really the craftsmanship that, uh, that they had and, and, and how carefully these songs were put together. Um, yeah. just, to, you know, that's one thing I love exploring in this book and, and in my columns is just, you know, how they, how they gradually constructed these songs. Uh, I mean, hmm. it's a lot of work. In fact, uh, Steve, I saw, uh, you mentioned a book, a, a new book that's out. Uh, I think you mentioned this on Facebook on, um, John Lennon. It's, you know, yet another so-called. Oh, guy. that, that one, that one. Yeah. The, yep. the one that. The uh, Daily Mail wrote up that would really trashed him pretty badly. It's not all on Lennon. It's it's on other stuff too. It's on yeah. British culture in general, but it, I guess it has a, a chapter on Lennon that really goes after him pretty hard. Yep. And one of the things that I remember you mentioning in this article was that he was accused of quotes never having a real job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Which, mm-hmm. That that just I mean, that's just hilarious on many levels. But but one of the things that made me think of was, as I said, these songs, I mean, they just I mean, it just took so much work and so many takes and overdubs all to create these these songs. And and I mean, it just took so much time. So, I mean, not having a real job. (laughs) What does that mean? Right. What what rock and roller Hmm. has a real job? Exactly. You know, that is their job. Yeah, exactly. And it's a hard job. I mean, I, I know the, the whole sex, drugs and rock and roll kind of lifestyle. But but yeah, you actually do have to do some work. And there's and as I said, there's craftsmanship involved and, and persistence. So, yeah, I just that was the last straw for me when I read that read, read your article, uh, or you, you know, linked to it. I thought that's it. That's not on my reading list. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Kit. Oh, sure. And I think I'm, I'm pretty sure. Well, uh, actually, let me just mention before before I pass this over to Alan, mm-hmm. I should mention that one of one of the chapters in the book, as I'm leafing through here, uh, because you've got this broken down into several different uh, kind of themed areas, mm-hmm. and uh, one of the chapters is is termed "What Album Is the Biggest Selling Album of the Decade?" Over to you, Alan. <laughs> Why me? <laughs> listen, listen. Okay, okay. It sold a lot of copies. Uh oh. Um, many, many of those copies to me. <laughs> okay. But still, I was just saying they should have done something more interesting. Anyway, <clears throat> so. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, um, I think um, I guess what struck me is the number of chapters where you, um, you know, you go through the history of the song and how it was made and and Mm -hmm. what's going on in it. But in the end, are fascinated 
particularly by what it shows about what they're eventually going to do, how you can see the, the, the seeds of something that they would do later in things going as back as far as, I guess, things we said today and, and maybe even earlier, you know, just just sort of experiments that they would would do. And I think you, you sort of alluded to that tonight, too. Um, so that obviously is a, is a fascination for you, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, like, you know, a, a perfect example of that um, is uh, The Word. You know, mm. that to me, that is that is such an important song, you know, on many levels. And, and one of them is thematically that's such an important song because it it's a shift you know before then i mean that was and 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 i think paul has mentioned this in different interviews that they tended to do more you know more straightforward love songs and it was you know love uh, it it was you know using the second person and you know but here we have a case now we we get to the word where of course they are discussing love but it's a different kind you know, now we're getting into something more philosophical uh, and and deeper and more abstract. And, you know, that sort of a it was a precursor in a way to what would, of course, become the summer of love and, and uh, themes that they would explore in uh, a bit more in Revolver, uh, certainly. Uh, and then, of course, Sergeant Pepper. I mean, it was but it was and, and um, uh, Magical Mystery Tour. I mean, it was the word is just this preview you know, of, of what was to come, uh, lyrically. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that was one of my favorite, that, that's actually one of my, my favorite chapters uh, in the book that I, I, I just thought, wow, here's a song that's a, a hidden gem in, in many ways. But one of the ways it's also a hidden gem is that this was an important song, you know, in, in their development and then their songwriting and then their, their, uh, the, the themes that they would address, you know, now we're getting into, you know, I call Beatles 2.0, you know, mm -hmm. getting, you know, getting away from and, and not to dismiss what they were doing before. I mean, I'm not saying what they were doing before was was, you know, simplistic or anything, but it's it's just a shift. You know, it's a it's a shift in in um, in subject. And as I said, getting more philosophical. Um, and and uh, I, I just you know, I just thought that was a fascinating song to to uncover and really say this is a song that that deserves you know multiple <laughs> listenings mm -hmm. one of the ones that i i guess i enjoyed reading the most was your chapter on rain and you find that one you know as you, you get to the end of the chapter uh, a precursor to tomorrow never knows she said she said i'm only sleeping lucy in the sky what is the earliest indication of, uh, you know, some of their m more musically experimental stuff, ap apart from the lyrics um, that you can recall having gotten to in here. I, I, I think it might be things we said today, but. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, gosh, it, you know, I mean, absolutely. Things you, we said today would be um, an example. I, I also think, you know, I mean, it. it I could list a number of, of tracks like thematically and, and all that, what they were doing, but even something um, like I call your name, that's one of my other favorites uh, mm -hmm. uh, from the book, because that was fascinating to research because that was an early um, attempt of theirs to incorporate world music, you know, uh -huh, into, uh -huh. into, and, which was fascinating because, you know, b before, I mean, of course I always knew when they all of a sudden shifted tempos uh, and, and the, what, what is that? You know, and so it was it was fascinating to look at it. And, you know, it was, of course, their uh, attempt at, at, you know, what was called Blue Beat uh, at the mm -hmm. time that would develop into reggae. And, and you know, but I mean, I wouldn't I, I just wonder, you know, how many songs were, were, you know, an artist were attempting to incorporate that kind of thing. So in a way, that was a pretty experimental track. Mm -hmm. uh, in, right. in a way. Yeah. And, and it was, and again, this is, this is a song that you tend to kind of overlook as, Oh, it's a fun album track and that's nice. But, uh, but it, uh, turns out there's, there, there was a lot more going on underneath. Uh-huh. So, uh, my copy didn't have the chapter on revolution number nine. Where is that? <laughs> 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 that's that volume two, Alan. Volume? Okay. 
<laughs> and uh, and for the solo things, I guess Life with the Lions will be uh, will will definitely be included, right? You you bet, a- absolutely. <laughs> but no, but you know the, the thing is, you know we we and, and yes, I mean that's not. Let's just say that's not something I flip on my iPod that much. But <laughs> 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 however, um, you know that that was a, a, a way though that I I think was one of John's many strengths is that he would try to, to, he really challenged the audience, you know, and obviously revolution nine was the ultimate challenge, but Mm -hmm. I mean, look at, you know, I want you, she's so heavy, you Mm -hmm. know, ending it with that white noise. Who was doing that? You know, I mean, who would, who else would try something like that? And that of course was coming directly from, you know, what the, the, uh, the art that he and and Yoko were, were experimenting with at the time and, and, you know, definitely her influence there. And, uh, but I mean, that was a a great example and, and perhaps a bit more, uh, shall we say accessible than revolution nine. Um, but, but that was another way that he was incorporating the avant-garde, you know, into the Beatles music and, 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 and I and by the way, I think this is another thing that a strength of the Beatles in general. They didn't, tr- you know, they they didn't. They said our audience are not they're not stupid. You know, we can challenge them in many ways. We don't have to just go, you know, play what is trendy and you know what will sell. You know, they they can handle classical music. They can handle a bit more. Uh, avant-garde they can handle Eleanor Rigby which is poetry and you know I Mm -hmm. mean the the audience isn't stupid you know they they can follow and and sure they probably lost some fans you know Mm -hmm. along the way with you know Strawberry Fields I mean I'm sure that freaked out some fans you know their early fans at the time but I think mostly they said you know our the listening, the, the the audience, the pop music audience is more intelligent and, and all, than they're given credit for. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if we try these different things, we think they will follow. They will be up to the challenge. And I think that's one of the things that really show that shows in, in their music and, and some of the songs that I discuss, you know, mm-hmm. is and, and they were one of the first bands, I think, to ever say that we're not going to follow the crowd. We're not going to you know, that's why they didn't do How Do You Do It, which was a perfectly good song. You know, right. and George Martin wanted them to record great pop song, but it wasn't forward thinking exactly show, yeah show they were very that. very averse to doing the same thing again uh mm-hmm. although you know you mentioned um i want you she's so heavy in that and the white noise but in addition the repetitiveness is sort of um you know what was beginning to happen at the same time in classical music was minimalism and mm. that was involving sort of repeating things and sort of like i want you she's so heavy's ending but in you know to give paul some credit um where he always says you know i was the avant-gardist not john um he did that in hey jude the year before. so you know, and it, it would be odd that maybe it's the white noise that, that makes the difference, but everybody seemed to accept it in Hey Jude a bit more than they did in I Want You, She's So Heavy. You Interesting. Know? I never thought of that. Oh. And, and you know, and of course, Hey Jude was also uh, uh, challenging the convention of what was the, the typical uh, uh, length. single length, like three minutes or something, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know. Right. To go on for almost what, like seven minutes? I mean, that seven was, plus. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, seven plus minute. I mean, wow, that was that was nervy <laughs> to do, to say the least. <laughs> but that's interesting. I I didn't really think of that. That yeah, Hey Jude was, and and you, as you said, it was re- is uh, repetitive and in, in some ways, and and uh, and I want you does sort of mimic that, and and yeah, did not obviously uh, resonate with people like Hey Jude did. Um, mm. So, oh, that may be in volume two. Thanks, Alan. Okay. <laughs> and another thing in the in the range chapter, you you talk about the the conflict between George Martin's version and John Lennon's version of who invented the uh, backwards ending. There, yeah. um, do you have a particular feeling about where the truth lies? Oh man, that is that is really hard to say because you know I understand that that. You know, John, what John said, and, and by the way, this is, I'm, and I'm sure all of you will, will agree, it, it presents a lot of, of research problems when mm-hmm. you look at John's interviews that right. he's done. Yes. Um, let's just say they're not um, the most consistent that I've seen, yeah. and it's kind of... <laughs> 
<laughs> and it kind of depended on what mood he was in that day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so I, I it's it's really, um, <laughs> you know, hard to say. I believe John 110%. And it's not because he's, I mean, I'm not saying he was lying or anything, but mm. it's just, you know, he, he would change his mind. I mean, you, you see it from interview to interview. So George Martin, I mean, it's, you know, there are times when, uh, and, and I have great respect for George Martin. I mean, absolute respect, but you know, memories over time uh definitely can change and uh i i don't know you know it it, it's so frustrating when you read or like if you read jeff emmerich's book which is you know which is great but there's a bit of a you know preference for paul and that and so Mm -hmm. you have to read it with that in mind you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's so hard to to determine so i guess i i guess maybe i would slightly favor George Martin, but boy, it's close. <laughs> um, I, I once asked George Martin about that conflict, actually. Mm. Um, and, you know, he, he had, it was when one of his books came out, um, the, la- the last one, the one that was in Genesis. I, I know you've quoted from it in, in your book. Yeah. Uh, can't recall a, t- a playback. Playback, um, yeah. And uh, I said, you know, um, you've told this story, and uh, but John has a different story where he says he went home and he took the tape and, you know, put it on the machine backwards by accident. And, and he came up with that. And he was actually very caustic, which is unusual for him. He said, wow. Yes. Well, John invented everything, didn't he? <laughs> Ooh. Let me tell you, he was the least technical of all of them. <laughs> well, and that is that is true. I've read that, that he was, yeah, technically, uh, he was really at a loss. <laughs> That's true. But it still doesn't totally contradict it in a way because, okay, he's the least technical of all of them. His story is that he accidentally put the tape on, you know, really, which, which so yeah, which that works. That does kind of follow, yeah. So, <laughs> so it didn't kind of really follow. solve the mystery, but uh, but at least we had a further comment on it. <laughs> uh, hey, so back to Al, I guess. Yeah. As a matter of fact, now this is a, in essence, an anthology of Kit's work. Mm-hmm. Over the over the years, uh, in something else, uh, in uh, Blinded by Music, uh, and and Beatle fan as well. Uh, but there is one what you might call Easter egg or bonus track uh, in this collection. And Kit, why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, this this is a chapter you can't find anywhere else but the book. It is. 10 of, of I, I think, some of, of Ringo's underrated um, drumming performances. And, and I, you know, came up with this because, of course, you know, being uh, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this year, finally. It's funny, you know, I, I, I would hear from people, you know, I talk to people about it and I'd say, well, isn't it great that he's finally in? And it was just the same old garbage. People saying, well, he was just lucky. You know, he was just the luckiest guy, you know, because let's face it, he was an average drummer and, and, you know, and I mean, it's, it's just gotten so tired and, and I decided, all right, I need to challenge myself here, you know, because I, as I read through it, I thought, wow, I haven't written as much about Ringo. So I went through and and listened to songs that I thought, I mean, I, I stayed away from the obvious stuff as much as good like rain i mean wonderful performance but ringo has talked about that numerous times Mm -hmm. so i thought okay we'll set that aside uh the drum solo in the end wonderful but but you know again too obvious so i thought let's look at at some that are a little uh less uh a little more subtle a little uh you know uh less obvious and and say how you know even some of a subtle kind of drumming really made you know could make a song you know make or break a song and I I, it was really fun to write you know because it was great to to revisit and and look at you know the kind of techniques he used and and as I said earlier you know he he had that imagination and versatility he was up for anything you know and I think that's what made him such a great drummer for the Beatles and, and in general, but particularly for the Beatles that, you know, he was up to doing, you know, something like strawberry fields where, I mean, 
you know, it was that was a very challenging song to do. And I, I think he was, as I said, just sort of up for, all right, let's try this. Let me drape these tea towels over the drum and see how that changes the sound, all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know how many other drummers would be capable of that, you know. And uh, and so that's that's what I, I try to do, as, as James Brown would say to give the drummer some and uh and to uh to just focus on on what you know he's not a technical drummer he's always that's always brought up but but that he was the right fit for this group and he was so versatile in how he could change to you know adapt his style to fit the mood of a song not just the tempo but the mood uh, and so that's the extra the the bonus track as I as I call it in uh, in the book. Now, in the same vein, uh, you've done over the last year at uh, various conventions and also on uh, Jude Kessler's John Lennon Hour uh, a piece you've you call the Ten Sounds That Change the World. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, have you tried it all to? do a a written version obviously it's tough to uh describe 10 sounds that change the world without having the sounds there themselves but have you tried to do any kind sort of a uh a a written version of that piece i would actually love to do that and i've been trying to figure out a way to do it because as you said you know it's hard to to write about it because obviously playing the sounds and, and this is uh, a presentation that that I I first I I I did at the Beatles at the Ridge Festival which right. is in Walnut uh, Ridge mm-hmm. Arkansas and I uh, did the first uh, top ten sounds that that Beatles sounds that changed the world and. I isolated different, uh, you know, a guitar riff or, a, um, you know, one of Ringo's drum solos or uh, a vocal. You know, I would just pull out these these different things. And it got such a great response mm-hmm. that um, that I decided, you know, I, I then started doing it. I did in L.A. I, I did uh, this past uh, fest in Chicago. Right. I, I hope to do it in New York. And uh, and this year at Beatles at the Ridge, I did a sequel. And uh, so I came up with 10 more and uh, and, you know, it's really gotten great response. And and uh, and all I can say is thank God for those rock band um, (laughs) mixes. Thank God. I got to say, I saw that I saw that in uh, L.A. and I was floored. It was it was absolutely fantastic. Oh, thank you. Yes. Well, I told you that in L.A. I mean, it was it was really it was really really interesting to go to go through those things and all all the you know the fascinating stuff that you pulled out um in that discussion was just was just wonderful it really was so oh, thank you i appreciate that well it's it's fun to do and and uh you know the audience real you know seems to to get into it and my whole full thing and and by the way this this is this goes for my book too is you know i love to just when i'm writing about these songs i put on my headphones you know, and I listen very closely to these songs. And in fact, a couple of people have told me who have read my book, they've said I put a pair. Of, I mean, I don't tell them to do this. They say when I a read your book, I put on a pair of headphones or I at least turn on the music and, and read as I'm listening to the songs. And I thought that's exactly what I want you to do. You know, mm-hmm. that's. Exactly. And, you know, the, the sounds is, uh, you know, an extension of that. I mean, it was, you know, it, it, it's just great to see when I have isolated the strings from yesterday. And I'll say to people now, you've heard yesterday a thousand times. You know, we all we all have. But I want you to listen to it with a fresh pair of ears. Listen to just the string arrangement. And it lends a whole different aspect to the song. You know, and I talk about, and Alan, I know you can say a lot more about this than I can, but, you know, the way that classical music was introduced, you know, and, 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 and melded with, with pop and rock music mm-hmm. and just that song was, was phenomenal, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's just great when you see the audience really listen to this and, uh, you know, really listen to Yes, a track like yesterday with with, you know, from a new perspective. Uh, and uh, and it's just a lot of fun to do. So I'd love to develop this somehow into an article or or a book and, and uh, just have to figure out how to how to replicate this just through writing. But I'd, I'd love to do it. And just to expand on 
that point about listening, you devote an entire section of the book to the 2009 Beatles remasters and in effect do a kind of a listener's guide to, to those. Tell us about that or how what you brought, what actually those, that's part of a series that you did for blog oh, critics? Yep, yeah, blog critics. And, and I'm so glad, uh, Al, that you pulled that out because I, I was talking about this with Steve the other day. This is like a point of pride with me, I have to admit. This mm-hmm. is... I was very proud of this. I, I will. That was a feature I worked very, very hard on, and and you know, because I wanted to present as full a picture as I as I could of you know what the remastering process is and what are the differences. And you know, and a number of people were asking me at the time, and I'm sure it was the same with all of you too. You were asking, you know, why should I buy these again? Right. You know, um, and and that comes up all the time. You think, you know, how many times can I, you know, buy Rubber Soul? I mean, you know, so I, I was trying to go through that and to show how different these these mixes were than the 87 remasters, which I like to say sounded like they were recorded in a tin can. I mean, they just were they were <laughs> terrible, terrible, you know, and uh, and so I. I like to, you know, I really wanted to show the differences. Um, now, I, I also, you know, wanted, wanted to make the point. I'm not saying that remastering is always the be-all and end-all. Uh, I was talking with Steve about this the other day about remixes, that the dangerous thing with remixes can be the, the temptation to correct can be a little hard. I mean, you know, I'm okay with correcting, obviously, like tape hiss or something like that. Mm-hmm. But but when you're getting into, you know, correcting a, perhaps a, an errant note or, you know, a background noise, a chair squeak or something like that, uh, that's when it's getting dangerous, you know, as I feel like you're tampering with history. And, uh, and so I'm okay with you know, enhancing the sound in, in some ways, but it can be, you know, it can be dangerous. And it was interesting when I was going through that, the research, and I was getting opinions from people, uh, different people I knew, um, including Al, I believe you're, you're quoted in there, mm-hmm. um, that, uh, and Steve, I think you're quoted. And, and so I, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, you know, I wanted to get an opinion of uh, is remastering, is it the be all and end all, you know, is, is this really, and, and I got kind of a diverse diversity of opinions was, it was very interesting because I didn't want to do a piece that just said, this is it, you know, this is every, it's, it's perfect. Um, and, uh, just go ahead and rebuy your whole coat, you know, just throw out the old albums and buy these and, and you're done. You know, I, I wanted to do a more nuanced look at, uh, the remaster. Right. So I, I was very, uh, I, I worked very hard on that. And, and even though of course now it's on iTunes and things have changed, um, I thought a lot of the, the, the topics that, that I brought up in that piece are still relevant, you know? And so I wanted to include it. So how did you feel about say the yellow submarine song track when the mixes were changed there? Yeah. Some people love those mixes. Yeah, and you know, and I mean, as I said, I'm I'm just I'm so torn about <laughs> about this. <laughs> you know, I really am because I I as I said, in some ways, remixes can can bring out some different nuances. In fact, today uh, I just got and I'll be reviewing soon um, the uh, remixes of Tug of War and Pipes of Peace. You know, and I'm very excited to listen to those and i was listening to the remix of of tug of war and it's fascinating i mean it brings out some instrumentation and all that i never noticed before um Mm -hmm. and you Mm -hmm. know but they're not at least they're not inserting it or i mean it's not artificial they they just you know up the volume and and i mean i'm not a a technical person when it comes to this but they you know they, they 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 just enhance they didn't try to change it you know, and that's mm-hmm. that's where I'm off, you know, I'm I'm off the grid or whatever when it comes to, you know, tampering too much with history. But I know that the sound, the uh, song track was, you know, was popular. I just have, you know, I'm just I have very mixed feelings about it. Um, Are you nervous? Are you nervous about the DVD? Well, I mean, the, well, the, the films, I'm not nervous at all. I mean, I saw the on uh 
uh, you know, online they had Strawberry Fields, the, the film, mm-hmm. and it was, I mean, stunning. Looks like it could have been filmed yesterday. I mean, it was just incredible. Mm-hmm. So that's that's fantastic. But yeah, when I heard that they're remastering yet again <laughs> the um, uh, the tracks for one, I thought, oh, what more can they do? I mean, what what is there to do? And and so I'm, you know, I mean, I'll I'll hey, I'll I'll still get it. I mean, I want to hear it, and particularly for the DVD. Uh, but mm-hmm. I, but I'm, I'm, I'm very curious to hear what precisely, you know, what more they can do with remixing. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I, I honestly don't know. You've heard a little bit right. of it actually already. I mean, if yeah. you, all, if you, all through the anthology, all those things are remixed for 5.1. Mm. True, um, right. So if you like the sound of the anthology, it, it may be more like that. Although they're not using those remixes, you know, they're going to be new. I think Giles Martin ones. My impression is that Giles Martin has a you know a good healthy respect for the stuff. Yeah, you know? and um, I think it probably will just be a question of you know placements and clarity and the fact that by going back to the master tapes or going up a couple of generations, you know more than they were able to by just remastering the stereo mixes on, in two thousand nine. So that may that may yield some greater clarity too. Yeah, and and having Giles involved, I mean, definitely makes me more comfortable. Uh, yeah, with it. I mean, because as you said, I agree. I think he does have a healthy respect. I mean, more than probably many other people uh, about you know keeping the integrity uh, of of the original recordings. You could also say he's going to be very fairly conservative um, mm-hmm. and, tradi- and traditional, which will make a lot of people happy. But we'll also there are also people out there that want them to take chances, and they pro- and that's probably not going to happen. Yeah. Well, well that's, I, what, that's what sort of love was for, you know. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Mm-hmm. I was just thinking that exactly because mm-hmm. I mean love. I mean because I put that in a whole different category, as you said. I mean that was wonderfully done. I mean I I thought for what it is for that project for the it it was it was stunning, you know, absolutely stunning. Well, I think there's two things about love. It's it's the, it's the way they, it's the sound, and it's also what they did with the tracks. Mm-hmm. And I thought what they what they did with the tracks because I've you've you hear all sorts of amateur mashups yeah, on YouTube, sure. and a sure. lot of them mm-hmm. suck. A lot of them suck very yeah. bad. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of them are pretty great. I, I you know I have not heard many good ones, Alan, outside mm. of uh, outside of love. I really haven't. Mm. Um, I thought what they did with with love was really good. I mean, steer me toward toward a couple of good ones because I haven't heard many. Most of the ones I've heard sound pretty bad. They sound really, really artificial. And that uh-huh. was the other thing that I thought they got. A, of course, George was involved with that one too, but they had a very. It sounded very natural. Um, and a lot of well, the, I mean, they had better better materials to work with than the people right. doing the amateur ones. Of oh, that, that's, that's, that's the amateur that's, ones were mostly also before rock band, which you know um, would allow a lot of other stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, the the talent in doing mashups isn't just the mixing; it's having the mind to know yeah. what songs work well together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the most brilliant things on there is combining. Within you, without you, with the uh, with the uh, backing of tomorrow never knows. Yeah. Right? To think of that, you know, that was brilliant. And you know, and that that had a great effect too because after I, I remember seeing love and and hearing that, and that made me go back to the original recording, you know, of the original version of Within You, Without You, and and that that remix gave me a whole new appreciation of of that song. Yes. I mean it it mm-hmm. brought out George's vocals which I think, you know, now in fact in the last uh top 10 present uh, sounds presentation I did I included I I found a nice uh, his vocals isolated which are mm-hmm. just incredible, you know, and the way he used his voice as an instrument um in that uh, to imitate uh, the sitar and 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 other uh instruments and in that which is very hard to do. Um, mm-hmm. you know, and he, he just did a remarkable job and yeah, that love remix really made me go back and listen to the original recording. So if, if nothing else, I mean, you know, the, the, if the love mixes will, will have people go back and listen to the original recordings in new ways, that's great. Those kind of remixes, I, I, I think are, are terrific. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I also yeah. like the uh, the background instrument in- instrumentation on "Within You, Without You" with the yes. Uh, I that that is really that, that is really that's awesome. beautiful. It is. It really is. Mm-hmm. You know, and it was funny. Uh, as I said, I did this the presentation recently, the sequel of of uh, the sounds, and when I played his vocals. I said to the audience, now, I know what you're thinking. This is the track I always skip when I listen mm. to Sgt. Pepper. And half <laughs> the audience nodded their heads. It was really <laughs> funny. And I said, if nothing else, if you get nothing else from this presentation today, go home, get out your copy of Sgt. Pepper, and, and give this another listen. You know, it's, it's there's more going on there than, than I think you may, you know, initially have thought. And so, mm-hmm. uh, but it's funny, yeah, because as I said, when I said, you know, I bet most of you skipped that track and everybody nodded. (laughs) Absolutely. And now, Mm -hmm. now for me, it's the one song amongst many that I appreciate so much more now than I ever have. I agree. I think it's, I think it's such a masterpiece on every level and way ahead of its time. Yeah. Well, and and I think that's the key. It was ahead of its time, you know, mm-hmm. and I think that, you know, you were t- saying earlier about Paul taking chances with um, Press to Play and everything that, yeah, you know, some fans don't like it when bands deviate, you know, from from their their known sound and, and go in a completely different direction. And, and uh, you know, it sometimes does. It takes years to to finally say, oh, I, I get what they were doing. You know, yeah, very much so. And incidentally, since Kit mentioned the tug of war and pipes of peace archive collections in the spirit of self promotion, I uh, should mention <laughs> that uh, that we will be covering those uh, those archive reissues in the next uh, probably within the next couple of weeks, hopefully with our friend Tom Frangione to give us uh, an expert analysis of, uh, uh, well, one of which is his favorite uh, solo Beatles album. This has been a fascinating hour, and uh, once again has been uh, all too fast. But before we leave, we do need to uh, to bring Steve in uh, for a couple of things, one of which is uh, the fact that he, over the weekend, uh, saw Ringo Starr and the All-Star Band in concert. And mm-hmm. you can give us a give us a report on that. Well, he played at uh, Masonic Auditorium in San Francisco um, on the first of October, and which is located right across the street from Grace Cathedral. And God, that was gorgeous at night because I had never seen that. But anyway, the Masonic was, was actually a very fairly intimate place. It was like an auditorium, and even standing in the back where we where we had to stand to shoot the pictures that we took for the for the article. Everybody had a really good seat. I I didn't go upstairs, so I don't know about upstairs, but downstairs, the seat the the views were great. And um, you know, he did his usual same length show. The the big thing was that he did um, Island in the Sun from uh, uh, Postcards uh, from Paradise, and he also um, brought back uh, Your Sixteen, which was kind of a which was really a pleasant surprise because that was one that I'd kind of wanted him to do again. And he did. So that was, that was also uh, a very nice, but it was, you know, it was the usual show. They, they uh, started out uh, praising each other, you know, how much they loved being in the band and how much they were, how, you know, there was a lot of that going around, which actually at this point is getting a little tedious on my uh, for me, because you know, I mean, you really want to hear, hear these guys play, and I'm—I don't know, guys. I'm getting to the point where I want to see a change in the band. I don't know about you, but um, I do. I mean, these guys are good, but um, I would like to see a couple of new people come in. Um, but we'll see what he does. Um, but anyway, it was—it was fun. Uh, it was a good. It was a. Uh, it was a good show. Um, the other thing I was going to mention was that uh, today. Another uh, auction uh, was announced, and this one's going to um, auction off the drumhead that he used on uh, the Ed Sullivan show. And all these things, all these historical, well, the 63 drum kit, and now this getting auctioned. Boy, somebody ought to be holding on to this stuff. It really kind of is a little irritating that these things are going to go by the wayside. And uh, although, you know, you don't know who's going to buy them, but still, it'd, it'd be nice to have these things exhibited somewhere and I guess that's not going to happen but 
what can I say? Anyway, but Ringo was fun, and if you he's out in your area, you know, by all means, go see him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a couple of things that were surprises there in the concert because he said many years ago he wasn't going to do your 16 anymore mm-hmm. because he felt uncomfortable in his age talking about the 16 year old girl. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, but you know, it's kind of like Mick Jagger. Does he stop singing Satisfaction? You know, it's oh. it's it doesn't matter. It's a great song. A great he song made, is a great made, song. He made one other comment, kind of like that. During the show, and I, I unfortunately I didn't write it down. I can't remember what it. He says something about, "Well, you Americans, you have this attitude, you know, kind of uh, that kind of thing." Um, but I don't know. Maybe he was just feeling really, uh, you know, a little loose the first night. But yeah, I mean, but he, did, uh, you know, I'm, I was glad to see him do it. You know, uh, it was good to to hear that uh, again. So, and I, in fact, I looked it up. He hadn't sung that since 2003. And uh, yeah. That wow. was, so that, yeah, that was a kind of a surprise. I was c- kind of curious, and I went back on Setlist FM just to see how long it had been, and I couldn't believe it had been that long. So, hey, and of his biggest hits, he hasn't done the No No song for quite a while too, mm. right? Mm. So, yeah, that's another one. Plus, of course, but you know, plus of course, the one that he still has never done, which was you know one of his biggest hits, and that's only right. only you. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's the only top ten hit. The only top ten hit he's had in the U.S. that he's never done yeah. live. Mm-hmm. You know, when we oh. when we had Tom Frangione on, we were talking about Postcards from Paradise and predicting what he would do in concert. We all thought definitely Rory and the Hurricanes. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. because you know oh. it's him showing pride in the band before the Beatles, and you know, another autobiographical song which he he seems to like to do mm-hmm. with Liverpool Eight. The Other Side of Liverpool, and also the, the title track, Postcards from Paradise. You can only imagine all the all the photos that he could show, probably from his book, sure. <laughs> while that song is performed. And so instead they chose the only song that was written by everybody in the band. How did that sound, by the way, Steve? It sounded like, like the album. I mean, it was the same, you know, and it, wasn't, it wasn't anything astonishing. Um you know, they sounded they sounded good. The, there was uh, Masonic had good acoustics, so the 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 place sounded pretty nice. I mean, I I, I don't think they they sounded better than they did in San Jose when I saw them last year, which was uh, much uh, the ceiling was much higher. This place had a kind of a fairly uh, low ceiling, so the sound wasn't you know didn't have so far to go. And mm. so it, I, I really like the place. I hope he goes back there again. Um, I hope he I hope he does that again. Um, but um, yeah. So was the set list any different for the other guys in the band? What do you mean? The other band members did they do anything different from the previous tour of um, their I think, material? I think actually, you know, I I didn't don't go through and. Look, um, let me look at the set list because I printed it all down the bottom here. Well, you'll be glad to know Rundgren did bang the drum. He didn't do. He didn't do. Um, what's that one song? Love uh, is the answer. No, he did. Love do is the love answer. Is, he did do love is the answer. Uh, um, Hello, it's me. Yes, that he did not do. Oh, that he okay. Did, that he did not do. Hmm. And I was actually well, disappointed. He, he did. I saw the light. Right. That's what he did the last tour. He didn't do. Uh, Hello, it's me. Yeah, but he's done. He's done hello, with me before, so right. So he didn't. He didn't do that. And uh, they and uh, Greg Raleigh did Oye Como Va, which I don't think he did last time either. Uh, yeah, he did. He actually did, he? did. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, they well, they didn't do everything is everything, which he did. I think the first the first tour. Um, mm, he, did, okay. he did. He did Black Magic Woman and Oye Como Va. Greg mm. Raleigh. Did. And uh, all right. So. But I think everybody else did just about everything the same. Hmm. Interesting. There you go. Very interesting. Yep. Well, this has been an absolutely fascinating hour. Uh, and Kit, I wanted to just thank you very, very much for, uh, for joining us. Well, thank you. I had a wonderful time. It was great talking with you all. The book is called Songs We Were Singing, uh, Guided Tours through, uh, Throughout the Beatles, uh, lesser known tracks and and more uh, 
as well. And uh, now, in in terms of contacting you, you're all over the place. We, your uh, uh, Kit still does the um, uh, Hard Days Net column in Beetle Fan, which she's been doing for just about twenty years, right? Yeah, next year will be my 20th anniversary. Can't believe it. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. Uh, you can contact Kit through uh, through Beetle Fan and also, I guess, through something else. Yep, and I'm on Facebook and Twitter. Just uh, look me up, and uh, I post all kinds of, you know, stuff, my latest articles and upcoming things I'm working on. So, uh, yeah, you can follow me both places. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. And Steve, uh, the, our, our contact info is? Uh, things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. We have uh, a group page and a radio page on Facebook. And uh, we're also page. on a what? We have a YouTube Right. We have a YouTube page. And we don't have. We're not on Instagram yet. We're gonna have to do that, guys. I don't know what we're gonna do, but we we, <laughs> <laughs> we got to join the crowd there. But we are also on Twitter. Things we said. Fab is our Twitter handle. So, there you right. Go. And Ken or Alan, anything to uh, promote? Uh, well, you can go to my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com, and every single week. There's Beatles Trivia, where you can win one of nine prizes. And it just so happens that um, this coming week, as soon as this, this gets posted, I have new prizes to give away, including Tug of War and Pipes of Peace, the remasters. And I also have uh, the new Jeff Lynn DVD, Live at Hard, uh, Hyde Park, to give away, and the new Hollywood Vampires CD to give away. So all this new stuff coming up, and there will be a special contest on my website where I'm giving away three CDs in one package. And that's starting this weekend as this show uh, airs for the first time. It gets posted on uh, on the Internet. Mm -hmm. And Alan, anything? Oh, uh, not particularly. I mean, if you haven't um, yet bought a copy of Got That Something, How the Beatles <laughs> Up, <laughs> yeah, there you go. You can um, get that, I think, on Amazon.com still um, as an ebook. And there is my 1995 Beatles book on Fiden, uh, published by Fiden called The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop. Which would be a wonderful companion to Kit's book. Yes, it would. It's true, and I just yeah. got a royalty check today, so it's obviously still selling. Right. <laughs> exactly. Well, once again, Kit, thanks very much for, uh, for joining us, and for Alan Cozen and Steve Marinucci and Ken Michaels, this is Al Sussman, and we will see you next time.